Hey guys, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is for you watching this video. So I wanted to do a video about discipline. Now, to be honest, I have like pushed this off for a while because nobody wants to talk about discipline in this generation. Um, so I think it's really important that somebody talk about it. Um, I'm tired of topics being too controversial or taboo or you do you or whatever you feel like is right in your own mind. So this is for believers. Um, I'm going to approach discipline from a biblical point of view because if you Google it, you will find so many different opinions of what the Bible means or says, or you will just find like we live in a Christian culture where we pick and choose whatever feels good to us. We can make the Bible make sense for that. So if we don't want to do something, we can find verses, pick and choose verses for what we want them to mean or believe. And this is a topic because I have, I'm 40 now. I'm about to have baby 11. I have, I'm seasoned, not all the way seasoned. My oldest is 14, but I'm seasoned in, in parenting, what works, what doesn't work and what the word of God says. So I wanted to share what wisdom I do have with you. And um, I don't want to share my opinion. I don't want to share my, even my experience. Um, with Although experience still can matter. I don't want to share my upbringing. I just want to share it from a biblical point of view, mostly. Um, I don't want to bash all the other um, parenting things they have out there today because there are a lot of very detrimental things that parents are using for their children these days that are raising up entitled and um, undisciplined and children that will fall away from the Lord. It is guaranteed on the way we discipline. So um, let's kind of get into it. I want to share the verses because there is a misconception um, about what the Bible actually says about discipline. And the Bible says a lot. I'm going to share most of it. Um, the first thing I want to say is no, no parent truly loves disciplining their children. It hurts us maybe probably more than the child. Um, we, and so we're going to fight it. Our flesh is going to fight it, which is why the Bible has instruction for it. The Bible does teach us how to discipline our children and what to do, what to avoid and what to um, do. Also, uh, Yahua God is our example for how to discipline. And I believe that the way we respond to God is going to be um, directly correlated with how our children respond to God. If we, if we receive the Lord's instruction, if we fear the Lord, then I believe our children will see that and I believe it all goes together. So um, let's get into, oh, one more thing I wanted to say. So like when I became a mother, all the ways that my parents disciplined me or raised me, um, even like, you know, all of us, I, this is what I tell parents. At the end of the day, our kids are going to grow up and have something that they are upset about or don't understand. Um, they're gonna say they were scarred in some way. I could look back on my childhood and say, oh man, I remember when my mom did this, How I can't believe she would do that or she didn't listen to me here or she, uh, I got in trouble when I didn't do this. And that's because we're, um, just self-focused and selfish. We're not understanding what our parents are going through or how hard it is to figure out which child did what or what they're going through. Um, so we're all going to have those pains in our childhood that we're going to have to forgive because at the end of the day, our parents aren't perfect. It's impossible for them to be perfect. And we have to have grace and mercy for our parents. That's called honoring your father and mother and respect for them. Now, there are people that were like tortured and actually abused, and they have a lot of pain that they're bringing into their parenting journey. And I want to challenge people to really look deep inside and say, am I parenting from a place of pain or am I healed? And do I want to do it God's way, even if it hurts me? Because I remember when I had my first child, 
and I I remember like my husband I was raised being being spanked um and you know then this new generation spanking is abuse um sorry that just really gets under my skin um I was spanked my husband was spanked he was probably like over, uh, a little bit further than spanked I was only spanked on the bottom um I think my husband was spanked several places like the stuff the stories he tells we would look back and be like oh you go to jail today but he is who he is because his parents disciplined him um now they didn't uh torture or abuse him they did normal things like normal spankings um they were good parents that cared about their children and wanted the best for them and so I just challenge us like my husband looks back and he appreciates every bit of discipline that he received he acknowledges it and I when I became a mother I was like oh okay mom all that like bitterness that I had hidden in my heart gone melted away every little bit of I wish he, she would have, or I wish she could have, or I wouldn't have felt that way if he, if my mom or dad didn't do this. It, it all went away. Like the instances where I struggled with suicide and the way my parents responded and how in my heart, it made me want to do it more. I look at it now, like my parents were not uh, coming at me in a hateful way. They truly genuinely loved me and were approaching me in a loving way. They no no parent knows what to do in these situations. We're all doing our best. Um and so anyway, we really do need to first forgive our parents. We need to see their perspective and um make sure we're healed from our childhood before we decide what kind of discipline and how we're going to raise our children. I think that's the most important that we don't discipline from a place of fear, uh, that we don't raise our children from a place of fear, that we are not uh, scared we're going to scar or scar them or hurt them because you will. I just want to put that out there. You will scar your children and you will hurt them because we are flesh and we have as children and as adults, we have our own little box that we see just what's happening to us and we don't always see um, what other people are feeling, thinking, or processing. And so um, I can think of a million examples, a million friendships where I can't believe so-and-so did this to me, but they're thinking I can't believe she did this to me. And I didn't realize that she thought that I did something and I think that they're doing something and we both are hurt not realizing where the other person's coming from or in my marriage where I think my husband's thinking something that he's not thinking and I'm taking it out on him, but he was never thinking that, but I thought he said it in a way that made it, you see what I'm saying? Um, and so we really have to die to our flesh, especially when we're adults and we can, we, we do have wisdom. We have walked more of our life and we do know um, more of what's right and wrong. We God has given you those children to train up and to raise. And you do have a, a big responsibility to train up your children the way they should go, to teach them, I'm talking to believers right now, to teach them the commands of the Lord so that they will not die. It is a big responsibility to be taken very seriously. So we want to do it the Lord's way because he is the only one that knows what's lasting. Yahuwah God is the only one that knows what's best for our children and how we are to raise them. He is the only one that knows how they will respond correctly and what is good for them. Just like he's the only one that knows how to discipline us and what's good for us. So let's dig deep into the word of God. I have quite a few verses. I'm going to go over them. Um, my plan is to read through them all and then discuss them, but I might be stopping in between them. So Hebrews 12, 11, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So we want to right here acknowledge that discipline is painful, painful. 
So when our children feel pain, we feel pain. It's painful for us and it's painful for them. Don't fight the pain. The pain will yield peaceful fruit of righteousness for those who are trained by it. Proverbs 12.1, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. So are we teaching our children to love discipline, not to fight it and not to, I mean, as a child, I can tell, my parents can tell me all day, I'm doing this because I love you. Uh, your consequences because I love you. This is for your good. As a child, we're not always going to see that. But like it says, uh, uh, there will come a day for me and some people it doesn't come, but that's between them and God. But there will come a day when you will say, oh, I see the fruit now. Okay, Proverbs 13, 24. Whoever spares the rod hates his son. But he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Now, I'm actually going to stop here and cover a topic that's super controversial. Okay. Um, I pray right now against any spirit of offense. I pray right now against any um, religious spirit or anything that could offend or attack and I pray right now for open hearts and minds and eyes that hear and see and can discern the spirit clearly I just pray the Holy Spirit would speak clearly through me as we dig deeper into this topic okay so the rod is a very talked about topic in discipline and in the Christian community now this is where spanking has come from they didn't call it spanking, and I do believe they used the rod on more than just the bottom. But let's talk about the rod. So Psalms 23, 4, David says, and this is a very, very well-known verse, the rod, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. He is with me. He, it says he is with me before that, but he is with me. His rod and his staff comforts me. Now, right here, it says, whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Now, there's a lot of people out there saying the rod is a directing tool, and I want to correct that. Um, he talks, David talks about the rod and the staff. As the staff is the directing tool. It hooks the sheep and guides them where they need to go. The rod they did use to hit them. Um, let me just give you another verse. Let me find it right here. Now, nobody wants to hear this verse, but let's read it. Proverbs 23, 13 through 14. And you can eliminate it from the Bible if you want, but it's in the Bible. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him, strike him, not guide him, strike him with a rod, he will not die. If you strike him with the rod, you will save his soul from Sheol. There's a lot more verses like this. Um, I just wanted to go into detail with that. Um, one more that, that goes with this. It talks about how God disciplines us. And he, so right here, Proverbs 6, 23, the commandment is a lamp and a teaching light and the reproofs of discipline are the way of life so the staff is a representation of his commandments as our guide to the life to the truth that god wants us to use so when we're teaching our children when we're disciplining our children when we use the staff we use the commandments of god to guide them and then the reproofs of discipline are their way of life so if we are following god with no fear of him we are not following god and I know that people are like, you should never fear God. That's terrible. No, it's not. Read the Bible. Fear of God is everywhere. Our children should have a level of respectful fear for, our, for their parents, where they know that they are not walking the way they should and there's consequences. That is fear. When you know that you could get in trouble, which you should, if you go steal something from the store and you're not afraid of getting in trouble, you have no fear of the government. We all have fear. When a cop drives by, we all are like, am I going the right speed limit? 
Am I going a little bit over? That is fear. If we didn't have fear of our government, of our police, of breaking the rules, why would we not have fear of honoring and obeying our parents and honoring and obeying God? Um, okay, so that is my take on the rod and the staff. Um, I do not, I, be, I strongly believe spanking is um, biblical. I believe spanking is necessary. If you choose not to spank, if you can discipline your children in a consistent way where you're not spanking, that again, that's between you and God. And if it, if it produces fruit, great. Um, there is, let me read another verse right here. Proverbs 22, 15. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from them. There are many children that that is necessary. Now, I understand there's lots of two children um, families out there, and those two children might not need to be spanked. They might not have, you know, we all know we have certain children that are super rebellious from birth and other children that are gentle, angelic, just, it is just their personalities, how they were created. So yes, I have some children that I don't even know if I've spanked. I have some children that definitely get disciplined more than others. Um, and so it, it is going to be based on personality. It's going to be based on the rebellion inside and how far they want to put like, don't touch that knife. Don't touch that knife. Don't touch that knife. It's going to depend on which child is going to be like, how far can I push you? Because children will see how far they can push you. Um, okay. And I, and I, if you don't want to spank, don't spank, but there has to be discipline and there's lots of different ways we can discipline our children. We'll talk about that later. All right. Revelation 319, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Now, Yahuwah God is constantly talking about how he disciplines us. So we are not exempt from discipline and we can take a lot from the way God disciplines us and use that for our, our children because he's the perfect father and the perfect discipliner. That's probably not a word. Okay, Proverbs 3, 11 through 12. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline, talking about Yahuwah, or be weary of his reproof. For Yahuwah reproves him who he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. So he does uh, relate his discipline to us as a father and son. And that's just showing you he, he commands us to discipline our children. Um, okay, Proverbs 29, 15, another one about the rod. The rod and reproof give wisdom. So it says the rod and reproof. Reproof is correction in the word of God. This is what is right. This is what is wrong. They both give wisdom. They're both necessary, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. Now, what is a child left to himself? It is a child with no direction, no rules, no structure. They're not told what to do. And to, and it's proven children with structure, children with rules thrive. They do much better than children left to themselves. And they feel safer and more secure, which is why David says, your rod and your staff comfort me. He feels comforted and safe by the, by the correction and the discipline and the guidance of Yahuwah God. Okay, um, let's see here. Proverbs 29, 17, discipline your son and he will give you rest. He will give you delight to your heart. Ephesians 6, 4. Now, this is where we get into what we should not do. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, we all know there is two sides. There's a middle ground to everything. Absolutely, parents can and do abuse their children. They take things way too far. Um... And that is not at all what I am saying at all. Um, we should not be provoking our children to anger. We should not be losing our mind on our children. 
Um, I want to talk about that a little bit more. So there is this, in my opinion, misconception that we are to not discipline our children in anger. I think that's where gentle parenting might have come about because that's impossible. And when I'm, I'm going through the Old Testament right now. I'm in 2 Samuel. So I've read a lot. And especially Judges. Yahuwah, God, disciplined his children over and over and over. And it says he was, the anger kindled inside of him and he disciplined them. He, it says he disciplined them in his wrath, in his anger. He did not wait years until he wasn't angry because they didn't turn from what they were doing to him until they were disciplined. So there's a million examples in Judges where he sent a judge. They followed Yahua for a long time. And then all of a sudden, the judge dies. And they have no structure, no leader. And so they do whatever they want. Everybody does whatever's right in their own eyes. They're, they stop following Yahua and they turn. So what does he do? He sells them to another nation. He disciplines them in his anger, sells them to another nation. Now they are repressed. They're slaves. They have that God is not protecting them. Their umbrella is lifted and um, they have no choice but to either turn back to God or live this new life of death pretty much because they knew the life they had in Christ, in Yahuwah. So, um, all of that to say, I don't believe that we have to, um, and also, okay, so I'm not comparing children to dogs, but let's just take a puppy. If you are training a puppy to be potty trained, they pee and then you wait because, you know, as a homeowner, you get a new house and they pee on your carpet and you're really mad. You got brand new carpet and they peed. If you wait until you're not mad to discipline your dog, they're going to be like, why are you disciplining me? They forgot they peed an hour ago. This is the same thing with our children. If we wait until we're not angry, which sometimes can take a while because our children can do things that are very unacceptable and that are dangerous and even deadly. If we wait to discipline them, they're going to not understand the severity of whatever they just did. So if, um, I mean, I could name a million things. I think you guys know what I'm talking about. If I wait to tell them not to touch the stove or discipline them for touching, well, if they touch the stove, they already have their discipline. Okay, we'll just say that. Um, hitting their brother, if I wait to discipline that until two hours later when I'm not mad that they just beat up their brother, they're going to be like, why are you even disciplining me? And it's not going to be the same. Now, there's a difference between an out-of-control anger where you have no self-control and then just you're angry. Now, I have, had, I have had moments where one of my children did something so terrible, like I'm talking it has to be real bad, that I have out-of-control anger and I absolutely do have to calm down or I have to give it over to my husband and say, you have to deal with this because I'm not in a good place. But for the majority of the time that we need to discipline, our anger is not out of control. And our anger, we are allowed to um, like tell our children they did something wrong and we are allowed to discipline them. So the Lord disciplines in anger. We are allowed to discipline in anger. We are just not allowed to abuse our children. And spanking is not abuse. If you feel like you need to like wail on them, yes, do not do that. You can spank in a way where you're not causing marks or abuse to them. Um, but it does, it does say here that it is going to hurt and that is good for them. It saves their soul. Now I know this is terrible. The things I'm saying are terrible, but that's just because we've become a na like a nation where you're not allowed to feel pain. Shame is awful like you can't feel any negative emotions and that is not the way that god created us the negative emotions are good they they will acknowledge sin righteous anger is good when your children are um not following the lord you should be righteously angry and if you're not i think there might be something wrong with you 
Okay. Proverbs 22, 5, no, I already did that one. Uh, Proverbs 23, 13. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you, oh, I, I read that one. He struck him with a rod. Maybe I didn't. This is another one. So see, it says it many times. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. He will not die. Unless you're abusing him to death. And I think we all, like I'm talking to parents that are like, I don't want to spank. I feel so bad. I was that parent. I didn't want to spank my daughter and my, me and my husband got in a big fight when I had our, our first child. I was like, absolutely not. She's just so perfect. But like my husband has really taught me um, the importance. And until your children grow up, you might not see what I'm talking about. You might not see the fruit of your lack of discipline or the fruit of your discipline. So I can tell you with my first son, I, <clears throat> I shied away from spanking and like a lot of discipline because I just felt bad. Like I love my children. Like I don't want to cause harm. I don't want to make them cry or make them feel bad. Um, but that's not love. The, the Bible is very clear. It's not love to avoid their pain so that they continue to walk in rebellion and disrespect and um, catering to their feelings is not love. That is, our feelings are deceitful. I have lots of verses on that also. We'll talk about that. Um, I'm trying not to make this video super long, but it's just happening. Um, so anyway, now that my son is 12, I can tell you, I remember that there was a shift in my home where my husband looked at me when my husband, I think my son was five and I actually sent him to public school and that's when he got really out of control. Um, and my husband looked at me and said, Carissa, if you don't get this because he's at work. So I do have the brunt of the discipline. Now he will come home and be like, why do I have to be the bad guy again? <clears throat> but he looked at me and said, Carissa, if you don't take care of this now, when he's 9, 10, 11, he will take you down. He will start abusing you. He will be strong enough to overpower you because he has rebellion and disrespect in his heart. And I will tell you that it that was 100% true. My son was going down that path and I had to get it under control and I had to get it straight. I've also seen parents that have not gotten their son, um, like they have not disciplined their son correctly. And now their son is 14 and screaming in their parents' faces, even hitting their parents. And what do the parents do now? Now he's at an age where no matter what they do, they can't cause pain. And he is not, he's practically without consequences because they think they know everything by the time they're nine, okay? My children definitely think they know everything by the time they're not. And my 12-year-old son knows everything. I'm wrong about everything. Anyway, um, so is it too late once they're that old? No. Is it 5,000 times harder? Yes. So this is to all the parents with young kids where you're having those, the, the, the fight within your soul of, Oh, I don't want to do that. Let me find some gentle way. They, that's what they're longing for is a gentle way to get out of everything. And the, and if just trust me when your child, especially sons, sons are even so much more important. We cannot allow them to speak to us in disrespectful ways. Just if they can do that to their parents, just imagine what they can do to their teacher, to the police, to, um, the Walmart worker. That is just not the way we raise our children in Christ. Um, I hope this is making sense and I'm sure everyone, someone's going to twist the things I'm saying, but I, I pray that this helps a young mom struggling with these feelings and seeing, um, all these like Christian blogs telling you that you can't discipline your children and you have to coddle, you know, there is a middle ground. You can take everything too far. But let's go back to the word of God. <clears throat> All right. Um, Proverbs 6, 23. For the commandment is a lamp and the teaching a light. I actually already read that. Where he talks about the two different things. The commandments are our staff, our guide. And the reproofs of discipline are our way of life. They are correcting us back into the correct way to live. 
Hebrews 12, 5 through 11. Now I do love this, <clears throat> these verses. This is how God is to us. Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? So sons and daughters. So this is how God addresses us. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of Yahua, nor be weary when reproved by him. For Yahua disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. You have to endure through discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Now, there's plenty of them today, but he is saying a, a true father disciplines his son. If you are left without discipline, and hold on, I have to say something really fast. If you're a, a wife and a mother that does not allow your husband to discipline the way they um, are convicted to discipline, I strongly suggest a uh Go to the Lord about something in your heart that is preventing you from giving your husband authority over your home. I used to be that that wife. I actually, like, th those were some hard beginning years of our marriage. I didn't like the way my husband disciplined, and I would not let him discipline in that manner. And I have learned a heart of submission and to know that he, they're his children too, and he's allowed to discipline them. You know, like, if I yell at my kids, it's justified and not that bad. But when my husband yells at them, whoa, 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 you're taking it too far. No, we just don't like anybody. So like I tell my, my child, stop playing in the sand. But if a, a random person walks over and says, stop playing in the sand, we said the same thing, probably in the same way. But how dare you? I'm allowed to. We have to make sure we're really preventing that spirit from coming into our home. That's a disunifying spirit that is not allowing us to unify with our spouse and it's giving our it's taking authority from our husbands and it will greatly affect our children they will not be disciplined we have to really be very careful we don't shut our husbands down when they're disciplining and that we don't shut down the ways that they want to discipline now if your husband is abusing like legit abusing if they just think that is not abuse and do not go to the police with that. That is not okay. If your husband is legit abusing your children, do not stand by that. That's sin. But if your husband is disciplining them and it just hurts your heart, you have to endure that because fruit will come. I'm telling you, every mother does not want to see their children in pain. If my child falls, I want them. I don't want my husband to comfort them. I want to comfort them because that's our role as a mother. But the role as a father is discipline. He talks about here, he doesn't talk about whom his mother does not discipline. He talks about the father. We have to give our husbands authority to discipline their children. They're not just our children. And I know so many wives and mothers that do not give their husbands the authority in their homes. They set the rules, what's, what, what can be disciplined or not disciplined. Be very careful about that disunifying spirit it is not of God and it will, will, I'm telling you, because I've been there, it will so negatively affect your children to a place that you might not be able to correct in the future. Okay. If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. So if we don't allow the Yahuwah to discipline us, we are not sons. We are illegitimate children rejecting his discipline. Just think about that for your own children as well. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. And you might not respect them until later, but you will respect them for the discipline. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? That speaks for itself. Um, one thing I do want to say about that is I do talk about the closer I get to Yahuwah, the closer, the more I know Yahuwah and I have that relationship, the more I'm disciplined. And when I talk to people about how, um, like Yahuwah disciplined me, they say, oh no, 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 honey, don't be so hard on yourself. That was not God. He would not do that to you. No, that's wrong. 
He does discipline us and it is what brings us to him. I will tell you, I had a blighted oval miscarriage um, after my fourth child. I almost died. And I can tell you in that miscarriage, I, my whole body, like I was 18 weeks pregnant with no, like the baby never formed. I don't know if you know what a blighted ovum is. So my body had the sac, but no uh, baby was ever formed. Like I saw the sac from the very beginning. There was never a baby there. Um, but my body, it's like a, a phantom pregnancy kind of, but you're actually pregnant without a baby. So I had all kinds of tissue. The whole sac had to come out. Um, and I remember like bleeding so much. It just would never stop. I passed out. Um, I remember before I passed out, I went blind and I have been in Bible college. I was raised in the church. I was on worship team. I led people all the time. I did my devotions. Okay. Um, almost every day, probably once a week. I don't know. I went to church. Okay. I went to church. I had a heart of gold and I was a believer is what I thought. And I remember knowing that I was dying I went blind. And then all of a sudden my body was completely on fire. Like I literally felt like I was sitting in hell and I couldn't see. And I remember grabbing my husband's hand and saying, I am scared. I don't know where I'm going. And I always thought when I got close to death, I would be like super secure that I was going to eternity with the father. I didn't. And so I remember like I had to, they had to rush me to a DNC, like half the sack was still stuck inside of me. And I remember waking up being so mad at God and God really like speaking to me and teaching me and showing me I was not going, I, I did not know him. I was not going to eternity. I was not safe and secure. I was not held in his hand and I was not following him. I was doing all the right things, living a religious life, putting him on top of my life. And I'm telling you, that was the discipline of the Lord. Without that happening to me, I would still be today walking around with Jesus on top of my life about me, doing everything for me and leaving him out and just going to church on Sunday. That is the discipline of the Lord. And we either accept it and turn to him or we say, oh, it's just the fall, a fallen world. It's just the way it is. Just a coincidence. We can do that all day. We can call every bad thing that happens to us a coincidence. And oh, it's the fall of the, the fall of the world, the fall of Adam and Eve. Nothing in that, nowhere in the Bible. If you look in the Bible and every time something that happened to them, the Israelites never said, oh, Adam and Eve caused this. The fall of the world is what made us be sold into slavery. No, they never said that. And I know this is like more, more than discipline. I just feel very um, like strongly I need to share this. Um, Yahuwah disciplines his children. He disciplines his sons. It is a compliment. And here's uh, something that should hopefully encourage you. There is a verse about Jesus. Oh, I have more verses than I thought. Where is it? Okay, Hebrews 5, 8. This is about Jesus, Yahusha. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. He learned obedience to Yahua through what he suffered. They even said that about Yahusha. So anyway, nowhere in the Bible does anything that happened to any of these people, it always says God caused this, God did this, God caused a harmful spirit, God cursed them, God sold them. And it never says, oh, it's just a fallen world, just happened to be like that. He disciplines his children. And what happened after he disciplined them, after he killed half of them after he um, sold them into slavery again for the 25th time after the promised land. He, it never said that if they would, they do. They cried out to Yahua and he saved them. Now, like the 30th time he said, sorry, not saving you this time. They went ahead and changed anyway. And then he saved them. He uses this. He knows. Yahua knows discipline causes us to get right with him, to come back to him, to fall in line with him. We know our inheritance is with him. Think about the prodigal son. The father, he gave his son 
and let his son go. He let him go. His son came back to him. That is how Yahuwah is. The son, the son said, oh, I had it way better at my father's house. He was rejecting the way he was being raised, but he eventually realized, oh, my father loves me. He cares for me. He was right. He was right. Our children might not see that we're right, but they, they will, and they might fall away for a time, which is why I hold very, very strongly to the verse that says, train of a child in the way they will go and they will not depart. And so with that, I, I call that a promise. A lot of people say it's not a promise. I'm holding on to that as a promise. There might be a season in my children's life where they think I'm wrong, or they think it was wrong, or they want what they think is right in their own eyes, and they will go chase that like the prodigal son, and they will realize that your father, your mother, Yahua, that they are right. They have you in the, they love you. They care for you and they have your inheritance for you. They didn't give it to you because they're protecting you. So all of that to say, um, discipline is from Yahua and we can look at our situations. He will use them to bring us back on the right track to renew our minds and our hearts every day. Okay. Um, in Job, it talks about, it even talks about discipline in Job. Job 5.17, behold, blessed is the one whom God reproves. Therefore, despise not the discipline of the Almighty, the discipline of the Almighty. I'm telling you, if we will accept the discipline of Yahuwah, we will be better parents to show our children. If our children reject our discipline, they'll reject his discipline. If we aren't teaching our children to honor and obey their mother and father, they will not honor and obey Yahua. They will have a hard life. And like it says here, it will lead to the death of their soul. This is serious, serious business. And we need to take it seriously and really understand the heart of Yahua. Deuteronomy 8, 5 through 6. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, it's just given. The Lord your God disciplines you. So you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and by fearing him. Proverbs 23, 13 through 14. Do not withhold discipline from... Oh, I read that one. Yeah, that's your favorite, right? You strike him, he will not die. Proverbs 15, 32. Whoever ignores instruction despises himself. So instruction is good for us. The word of God, his commandments, they are good for us. They're not a father being like, do it my way. It doesn't change his outcome. He is not benefiting from us obeying him. His obedient, the obedience that he has for us is for our good. I tell my children all the time, if you will wake up and obey, your life will be a lot better. It doesn't totally affect, like, yeah, it's hard for me when my children are be walking in disobedience because it breaks my heart, but it doesn't make my life change. Um, it might make it a little bit more stressful for me, but my life doesn't change that much. If you're obeying or disobeying, you're going to get, you're not going to get to go to, to soccer. You're not going to get to play basketball that week. You're not going to get a uh, tablet time or your phone for two hours. You're going to, to have consequences, not me. So instruction, discipline is for our good. Um, so it says, whoever ignores instruction despises himself because it's for you. But he who listens to reproof gains intelligence. These are things we really need to be teaching our children. Um, Psalms 94, 12 through 14. Blessed is the man whom you discipline, Yahuwah and whom you teach out of your law to give him rest from days of trouble. Now, don't we see that with our children? When we t give them instruction, it's to give them rest from days of trouble, to keep them out of the prison, to keep them walking in the laws of the land, and then to keep them walking in the ways of the Lord so that they can have eternal life. Until a pit is dug for the wicked, for the Lord will not forsake his people he will not abandon his heritage. He will continue to discipline us because he will not forsake us. It doesn't say he'll just keep pouring out blessings and love over and over. That doesn't correct us. 
if you read the Bible, I'm telling you, read the Bible. It is like life giving to our motherhood, to our parenting, to our way, our, our understanding of how Yahuwah works and what he has given us and done for us. Oh, if we will read the Bible, we will see over and over his correction, his discipline, a, as harsh as it might seem to us today because we live in such a sissy world, as harsh as his discipline is to us when we read the Bible, that is what caused them to go back to him, to find life. He says, choose this day, life or death. Those You have two options, life or death, my way or your way. And do we not say that or think that with our own children? Like, I know that you shouldn't climb that. You can fall and get hurt. I know you shouldn't touch that. It's hot. I am... Okay, let me finish these verses before I get into a little bit of details. Ephesians 6, 1 through 9, children, obey your parents in the Lord. Now, this is for our children, and we need to teach this to our children and all the time. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. So he puts a promise on it. You obey your father and mother. It may go well with you, and you will live long in the land. This is a promise to our children. And if we aren't teaching our children to honor us and to obey us, we are, we are um, eliminating them from this promise that the Lord has given all of our children. We really have to understand this. Now this year, as I'm reading through the Old Testament, I'm like blown away. So like we all know the Ten Commandments says honor your father and mother, right? I'm blown away by how many times Yahuwah reminds them to honor their father and their mother and how important it is to him. It is so important to him. Why? Right? Why is that important to Yahuwah? Like, why not? Why don't, like he does say, love and obey him, but he adds on that honor and obey your father and mother. Well, let's think of why. It's exactly what I've been telling you. If our children are not being raised up to honor their father and mother, they will not honor Yahuwah. If they are not obeying their father and mother, they will not obey Yahuwah. Now, does that mean that if your, par if your parents don't raise you in the ways of Yahuwah that you're not going to obey him? No, 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 no. Like, of course, there's exceptions. But when we are a believing family, the chances of them coming and obeying Yahuwah, that, that's how important it is. When we honor our father and mother, our hearts are inclined to authority. Because when they're under our authority, they won't be forever. They'll be under Yahuwah's authority or the police's authority. They're either going to honor them or not. They're either going to honor Yahuwah or not. So if they're not honoring us, the likelihood of them honoring Yahuwah and walking in his ways or honoring the government or uh, the rules of the land are very unlikely. And so it is very important that our children honor us. And God knows that. He knows that if we, if our children aren't, aren't honoring us, they don't have a, um, a bright future. They won't be good citizens of the land or citizens of the Lord. Colossians 3.21, uh, this is another don't. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. So being careful that we're not um, only discipline, discipline, discipline. We also have to encourage, encourage, encourage. So he's just warning that you can take it too far and they can become discouraged if you provoke them. Now, provoking somebody is like, um, if I correct you, I'm not provoking you. If I discipline you, I'm not provoking you. Provoking would be like taunting, making fun of. Um, so we have to make sure that we're not mocking our children in the discipline. Uh, I think that is a big, a big difference that we want to, to look at. Uh, let's see here. Proverbs 13, 18, poverty and disgrace come to him who ignores instruction, but whoever heeds reproof is honored. So if you heed reproof, you are honored by Yahuwah. If you ignore instruction, you are guaranteed poverty and disgrace. Do we want that for our children? Of course not. 
So disciplining them is so necessary. Another one, Exodus 20, 12. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. So the continued promise. Um, and just know, I don't have all of the verses here. There's so many, but I have like the main ones. And he repeats this stuff over and over and over. But 1 Corinthians 11, 32. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned with the world. Yet who doesn't want us to be condemned or judged on judgment day with the world. And how is he going to prevent that? By disciplining us. Okay, so let's get into some practicalities. Um, that is for the, the most part why we must discipline our children. How important it is to have consequences. And how important it is that like don't shy away from... Like, don't allow your feelings of um, shame or, or pain or sadness or your past to get in the way of your children's future. You will be limiting your children's bright future by refusing discipline. You might feel like a better parent in the moment, but you're destroying your children. That's why we don't parent based on our feelings and why we don't parent our children on their feelings. Because if I parented based on my feelings, my children would not be disciplined and they would be out of control and they would be suffering because when our children are left to themselves, they will suffer. They will destroy each other. They will have no uh, boundaries or rules and that is very dangerous for a child. They could even kill themselves. So the keys, the, the main keys to disciplining our children, number one is consistency. So whatever form of discipline you use, consistency. Now here are my suggestions to you. From there, there's age ranges um, from around age one and a half to, um, to seven. I believe those are the spanking years, the years where they have physical correction. Um, that is usually what help, what will correct and redirect a child of those ages. Now I'm not talking about slapping, hitting them. And my, what I believe, um, is spanking their bottom and I don't use my hand. So whatever you want to use to spank their bottom, um, is what, what I believe should be the consequence between those years. Some children might not respond to spanking, but some, I think a lot of parents don't even give it a chance. They're just like, oh, well, it didn't change. Sometimes they need a consistency of spanking to see that, oh, they're serious. Um, I will tell you, I'm, I'm pregnant like every year a lot, right? Pregnancy will make me just be like, oh, I'm not dealing with this. I'm not dealing with them. Like, whatever, deal with it, figure it out on your own. And so they're not getting consistent discipline. And I'll, I can tell you that those times where I'm like in my first trimester and I'm ugh, sick, um, my children suffer. I, I see rebellion and like all kinds of stuff because I'm not consistently correcting, disciplining, spanking. The, and even my older kids are like, mom, can you please discipline them? Look what they're doing. They're destroying my room. They're fighting. They're eating all the food. We have no food left. Now we have to clean up what they did. And so it is important for the whole family dynamic that we're consistent. Um, the other things you can use, of course, are timeout. Most children will not sit in timeout. So if you take a, a five-year-old and say, sit in timeout, you turn your head, they're gone. Well, now what are you going to do? Um, and so that, that, that is, uh, like you can keep putting them back, keep putting them back, keep putting them back. It's going to take more effort on your time. And most likely you're not going to be as consistent. Um, once they get like age eight and up, uh, usually age eight to 15, 16, I suggest taking things away, taking privileges away, taking, um, electronics, outdoor time, uh, I mean, I hate to take away outdoor time because it's so good for them, but whatever they love and some parents are like, they don't love anything. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. All of us would hate certain things. If that means taking dessert away, if that means sometimes, um, sending them to bed early, the whole family stays up and you send the, the their consequences. They have to go to bed early. 
that is often the um, hardest for my children. Ha are they hurt? No. Do they feel left out? Yes. But that is a consequence where they don't feel physical pain, um, but they they understand, oh, like I, I need to get right with it. I need to get this right so I can spend time with my family or I can stay up and do whatever fun things they're doing or, um, you know, kids just want to stay up. Um, and then taking, uh, I like basketball is my family is whew, big thing. My kids missing a game would be the end of their world. Uh, my older three have two hours of phone time a day. Uh, so I will have to take their phone away if they, if I have to continue, if they don't do their chores over and over and over, I've told them 10 times then we have, then we'll have that, or they don't get their phone until they get their chores done or whatever. You do what works for you. You find what works for you, but you stay consistent and you keep your word. If you say, if you say, if you do this, then I'll do this, then make sure you do that. Or if you don't behave in the store, you're not getting candy, then don't give them candy. Or if you say, if you throw a tantrum, I'm not giving you that sucker, but you know, if you give them that sucker, they'll stop the tantrum. I know it's hard because that's miserable for you to just hear crying for hours, but you can't give in. If you give in, they see your weaknesses and they push their boundaries. Discipline is key and keeping your word is everything in the middle of that. Now, there are some things that have natural consequences. So you say, don't touch the stove. They touch it. They, they get burnt. That's their consequence. I'm not going, you're not going to go on and discipline further than that, that they, they, they learn their lesson if, if it's a really bad burn. Um, and I'm not talking like crazy bad. Gosh, I can just imagine what people are going to say about the things I say, but you know what I mean? If they like, don't really get burnt, they don't have a consequence, but if they burn their finger and they have a blister, they're going to, they are going to learn. I'm not going to touch that again. Um, Yet, if you say don't climb on that, you're you could fall and then they fall. That's their consequence. There are natural consequences to a lot of things. Um, so we don't always have to do them on top of that, but we can sit down and talk to them. So discipline isn't just spanking, taking away. It's also teaching them what the right thing to do was, or this is what would have happened if you would have done this. So we do have to use the staff, the guiding and directing, and the rod. They go hand in hand. Um, okay, another thing, one more thing I wanted to talk about, and then I'm almost done, okay? Um, the allowing them to help around the house. Now, I've seen a lot of people say, your children shouldn't be have to do anything, you're the mom, blah, blah, blah. That's terrible, okay? Um, now, I'm not running a military base here where uh, everybody has to do everything and I sit there and serve me. No, that's not motherhood. Um, but motherhood also isn't, I'm your servant and you sit down and I serve you. That's raising entitled children with no discipline, no self-control, and they will go to college or they will go to their workforce and they will look for the boss, the customers to do stuff for them. And they're, they're not going to flourish in life. They're going to have children and just not know how to serve their children or serve their spouse. We need to have servanthood children. Um, now, I'm not uh, obviously not saying they have to do everything. As moms, we find it an honor and a privilege, or we should find it an honor and a privilege to do to cook for our family, to clean for them, to wash their clothes. Like there are a certain degree of things that we take on, but if we don't let our children help us, they go into the real world with no skill. And then what have we done as moms? Coddled them and treated them like babies their whole life. And now they don't know how to do laundry. They don't know how to wash dishes and they're terrible spouses and they're terrible parents. And so we have a responsibility to train up our children, to teach them, which is why another reason why I chose homeschooling because when they're in school all day, they're, the last thing I want to do is make them come home and now teach you how to do laundry. You're exhausted. You practically worked a nine to five at school. Um, and so it is hard. I understand it is hard to teach your children or to even ask them to do anything after they've been at school all day. But when they're at home, and, and also a lot of people think that um, having 10 children, you're all of a sudden like raising slaves. It's actually very opposite. Um, 
you have more hands and less work. So when there's two children in the household, the chores can take forever because you only have four hands. But in a household with 20 hands, the chores don't take that long. Everybody cleans a room together, five minutes. One person cleans that room an hour. Um, and so your workload is spread out and you're, you don't, you're not doing as much and you're learning how to work together. You're learning how to, to go through different personalities. You're learning how to be a team player and all of that. Um, so allowing them to help to do chores, to have responsibility, it's all very healthy, very good. Even allowing them, now I have, I have children that beg, I'm not even joking, beg to take care of the baby. And often they like to play house. You know, our kids, they like to play make, make believe. Well, it's not make believe, it's true. They're gonna one day have a house with a husband and children, but they like to play what they see. Um, and so they'll like to play house and somebody will want to have the baby. Um, so my children are begging me all day. Can I change the diaper, please? Can I, can they, and you know what, right now, every day, one of my daughters begs me to let the baby sleep in her room. And I'm like, I don't, I would not do that to you. Like, that's what I'm thinking. I just wouldn't do that to you. Like the responsibility of if he cries, getting up with him, I could never, but she begs me. So all that to say, let your children, like they beg me to cook. Now, sometimes that one's hard for me because I just want to get it done and cooking for a large family can take a while. And I'm like, I don't have time for this, but we do need to allow them to foster those gifts that they have. Like one of my children is motherly and she wants to do that. And I, me shutting her down because I feel bad is not parenting and that's not helpful to her. God's given her this desire and this gift and I need to cultivate it and walk with her and teach her and train her how to do it rather than being like, no, 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 no. It's my job. It's my job. That hurts them. Um, and the more you shut it down, the more they push it away. So just be cognizant of that. Um, okay. One more thing and I'm done. Okay. I hope this wasn't too hard for you to listen to. Uh, okay. So the gentle parenting focuses a lot on feelings and emotions, coddling to our children's, uh, feelings in the moment. And like the Bible said, folly is bound up in a child. If, if I am, I'll, I'll just say this about me. There, do you know how many times, okay, now this, this, I, I know this isn't just me and I'm going to be honest. Do you know how many times something happens to me? Somebody say, let's just say my husband says something to me that I take way wrong. And the enemy comes in and spirals me into this dark, dark place of every thought and feeling and emotion that I could possibly have. And now he is the worst person ever because I've allowed every thought I've ever had about him, every negative thought to take seeds and sprout. And all I want to do is go to somebody and just tell them every bad thing about him, right? We have all been there. You just want to vent out every terrible thing that's happened to you ever in your life. And then you feel better. No, nobody ever feels better. You just feel worse. When you vent out all those feelings, those terrible feelings inside of you, you're justifying your hardened heart and you don't feel better. Venting is not the answer. Allowing our children to feel their feelings. Now there is a level of um, helping them process their feelings with the word of God. But sitting there and allowing them to just vent out and feel every feeling it's detrimental. We have to be very, very careful with that because they can spiral into, oh yeah, you're right. I suck. I do want to hurt myself. I've seen this time and time again. I've been this time and time again. It's dangerous. Be very careful. What we want to do is redirect them to the word of God. This is what God says about you. This is what that, this is maybe that person's having a hard day. Let's love them through it. Maybe, uh, you got in trouble because you did this and, and, your, what would have happened if you didn't get in trouble and you kept doing it? Like talking through those things are good, but there has to be a rod and 
a staff, a staff that guides them through their feelings, but doesn't allow them to sit and coddle and dig deep, dangerous holes of their feelings. So the Bible says about our feelings in our heart, Jeremiah 17, 9, we all know this one, your heart is deceitful. Be very careful with your heart. We need to teach our children, be very careful with the heart and what we're feeling because our feelings are not truth. They are not truth. Feelings can help us realize, oh, I'm not following God. So there are shame can, there's godly guilt where you're feeling guilty about something. And that's what God uses to bring you back to him. That's conviction. But our feelings um, and self sulking are not healthy. And we, we do need to apply the word of God to it. Proverbs 28. And he always talks about giving up your life. Die to yourself. When we are just sitting there, just thinking about everything about us, we get stuck in a never ending tunnel where our life is terrible. But if we change our focus, so I'll tell you as a mom, we all know this. If I go in the kitchen and I think, oh, they didn't do the dishes. Oh, they, they never do anything. And I get, I get stuck in this rut a lot. Okay. I ask them to do this, I ask them to do this. Oh, and and it's all about how I feel and what they made what they've made me feel. I can spiral into a bitter, 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 bitter motherhood. But if I change my focus to serving them and being like, this is such an honor that we have dishes to clean and that I have laundry to fold and that I get to love my children by serving them everything changes and as believers we are called to serve our husbands serve our children that does not mean that that they do nothing it does not mean we excuse bad behavior but it does mean that when you are in a really negative place redirecting to service to um getting the focus off yourself will change everything if someone is bullying you if the bible tells us this if someone is bullying you, bless those that curse you. That is your way to freedom. Not, I'm going to spew every every bad thing I'm thinking and feeling, or I'm going to take it out on people. We teach our children to bless those that curse us, to pray for those that hate us, to do all of these things to serve those that take from us. If somebody takes your coat, give them your shoes. The Bible talks about this. That's how you... Um, heal internally that is how you live a life dead to yourself and alive he says if you don't if you give up your life you'll find it that's what we need to be teaching our children okay proverbs 28 26 whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool so we have to be very careful we're not telling our children to trust in their own mind proverbs 14 12 through 13 or us we don't want to trust in our own mind on how to be uh, good parents or how to discipline our children. Proverbs 14, 12 through 13, the way that seems right to him, there is a way that seems right to a man. There will always be a way that seems right to you, but in the end, it is death. So be very careful that you are not following your way that seems right to you, but that you know what the word of God says. Proverbs 12, 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. But a wise man listens to advice. So I'm um, really like te having teachable children. And then Proverbs 29, 11, a fool gives vent to his spirit. So a fool gives vent to everything inside of him. He's giving vent to everything that's going on inside. But a wise man holds back. So we don't, we don't want to teach our children to just give vent to every feeling inside of them. We need to be very careful about that. So anyway, I hope that was helpful. I hope that helps somebody. Um, let me just make sure I got everything. Um, a lot of people I have heard before, Jesus would never spank his child. And all I want to say is read the Bible. There's not much more I can say to that. Um, Jesus did not hold back. He was harsh, he was truthful, and he looked people in the eye and said, if I've offended you, you can leave. He did not sell them a false gospel. He did not paint rainbows and roses. He was truthful, 
to the point he would he tore down the tables he was serious and he understood the severity of following Yahuwah. And so if we want to live like Christ, and if we want to, um, and he, he took the commands of God very, very seriously. So if we want to live like Christ and we want to be good parents, and we are believers, we need to know what the word of God says. Don't go on Google and take what every Christian says the Bible says, because I will tell you this 100% for sure. I've been studying front to back the Bible for the last six years, reading the whole thing every year. If I Google a question, I will not get the Bible. They will give me Bible verses here and there and make up their own opinion. I want you to be very, very, very careful about that. Google, Google Bible, Google blogs, be very careful. Does that mean they're all wrong? No, but we don't go to Google blogs for the truth. Now, if you want to, if you have, if you don't have time to, you know, we can't all just read the whole Bible in a day. If you need an answer right away, there is a website, open Bible. Uh, it's open Bible.info and you can like search verses on discipline and it will give you a lot of verses. Now just know there are a lot of verses that when I read the Bible front to back, you will never find on Google, no matter what website you use. They are just for some reason eliminated. I'm, I'm sure the enemy has a, a part in that. And so you do still want to, when you read the Bible and you're struggling with something like, what does God say about this? As you read through it the whole year, I promise, promise the Holy Spirit will teach you. I promise the Holy Spirit will bring clarity to you. And as you read year after year after year, you're going to see more. You're going to get more understanding and more clarity. The walk with Christ is a walk. It's a perseverance. It's a daily thing. Renew your mind daily. If you are asking him a question, he says, seek me and you'll find me. Seek, 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 and he will teach, teach, teach. Don't ever give up. Um, he has grace for those that are walking in ignorance and don't know. He has grace for those that haven't heard the truth yet. So, um, the Holy Spirit is the best convictor. And if you feel something is not right in your soul, in your spirit, follow the spirit over the flesh. Just know that when you walk in the ways of, of Yahuwah, the ways of God, that your flesh will not want it. So if you know you should bless someone that's cursing you, know that your spirit and your flesh are going to fight and your flesh is going to say, no, that doesn't feel good. It does not usually always, it hardly ever feels good to follow God initially, but after you've blessed them, the freedom, the joy, the peace, unspeakable. That's unspeakable joy. That's unspeakable peace. It's denying your feelings and your flesh to get to the place of obedience. And then he pours out the joy, the peace and the obedience. I mean, the, the joy, peace. Joy, the peace, and the comfort. Now I'm telling you, and the love. It is one when we obey God that we feel his love. Um, there was one more thing I was going to say. Oh, people ask me all the time, how do you know the word of God is true? How do you know this is the right way? There's a million ways. How do you know this is true? Th this can be uh, translated in so many different ways. Let me tell you how I know. When I obey it, when I bless those that curse me, when I give to those that take from me, when I walk in love and obedience, when I obey his commands, it proves true. When I get persecuted, but I worship and find joy, everything I follow in the word of God, it hurts and it's hard and I don't want to, but then when I do it, everything he promises, I feel. So it has, it proves true. I'm telling you, obey it and you will see it, test it. And, uh, so I'll stop there. I could go on forever, but I hope this was helpful. Leave a comment. If you got anything out of it, um, ask me a question anytime. I know I'm an open book clearly. And, um, that's all be blessed. Have a great weekend.